is where we are this morning. And uh, so we're continuing on with our study through the uh, Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be able to finish this, I believe, uh, Lord willing, next week. And then we'll start getting ready for some Christmas stuff because uh, that, that holiday is coming. Do you guys know that? It, it just comes every year about the same time, I've noticed. So, um, but it'll be, it'll be right here, and we're going to hopefully have our hearts prepared for it, even though uh, if you're anything like, uh, like Katie and I, sometimes our houses don't get completely ready, and <laughs> finances don't get completely ready, and everything else. But let's make sure our hearts are ready for it. All right, Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to pick up in verse 16. The scripture says, Whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they make their faces unattractive, so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, pull oil, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where, there, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves don't break in and steal. For they, they, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We love you as we study this scripture. Help us to really understand what this means. Lord, help us to change our behavior in accordance with your word and not try to change your word to, to make our behavior justifiable. Father, so I pray. Amen. So we uh, take a look here, and we're going to kind of jump, jump through uh, verses 16, 17, and 18 uh, fairly quickly. When we look at 16, 17, 18, it's very much like the rest of Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Jesus is, is addressing the fast, and he's, he's, again, going just right at the religious leaders of the day. When the religious leaders of the day would go on their fast, they made sure you knew it. Again, that's kind of the, it's kind of the model that we've seen. We've seen that with their prayer life. We've seen that with the way they give. Uh, we've seen that with, with the, almost every aspect of their public life, that whatever they did, it was almost like it doesn't count if someone doesn't see it. And... Uh, their fasting was no different. So when they would fast, they would purposely put older uh, clothes on. They would, they would purposely dress uh, uh, lesser than what they would normally would. They would make sure that their, their skin would kind of, uh, they would dehydrate themselves so that their skin would, would, uh, would not look as, uh, uh, as good, I guess. It would look more crinkly or whatever, whatever hydration is. I'm sure someone who who's out there in the, in the oils market will tell me everything I'm saying wrong about what happens with skin when one dehydrates. But, um, but whatever the case is, they would make a, it was a scene. It was a performance. And so, again, we see that word, that hypocrite, which, again, hypocrite wasn't a word designed and made for people who are, uh, go to church and act like they don't outside of church. That's what we use it for. But hypocrite was just the word for a, a play actor. And so he's just applying that same uh, thought there. The thing that I want us to take out of verses 16, 17, and 18 is the same thing that we talked about with uh, prayer. It's the same thing that we talked about with, with the giving. But it's, um, first, Jesus doesn't say don't fast. And I know that I'm in a Southern Baptist church. And I know we just had a beer hunter's breakfast. And I know we're going to talk about having a, another meal here in a little bit. And I know that, like, the 11th the commandment was if there's two or three uh, Baptists, we're going to have some food. But, but uh <laughs> There is actually an expectation for fast, and, and, and I would like to get more in depth with that on another time, uh, but I will tell you that if, if you uh, feel so led to do so, that it is to be kept in secret, it is to be, that's a, it's a deal between you and God, 
the duration of the fast is between you and God. You may decide that you want to say, uh, I'm going to take a, a social media uh, fast. I'm not going to be on social media, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or any of that kind of stuff. I'm going to take a, a one week uh, fast on that or I'm going to take a 40 day fast on that. I'm going to take 24, whatever the deal is, it's between you and God. And uh, uh, you can do it with uh, food, you can do it with water, you should not fast without water, that would be bad. You could go water only, um, but whatever your fast is, uh, that's between you and God, it's supposed to be done in secret. And, and the, the scripture's not saying don't do that, it's saying don't make a scene about it. And then move on from that, that fasting and go straight into verse 19, and they say don't store it up for yourselves, Treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Do not store with yourselves possessions on earth, or uh, your treasures on earth. And this is kind of interesting. When I, when I first uh, read that, uh, there are a couple of things come to my mind. The first thing is, is I have to think to myself, what, what is my greatest possession? You know, what, what's my greatest possession? You know, if, if my house were to burn tomorrow, or today, it doesn't matter, what would I be most sad about losing? Um, you know, and, and, and just, just, I mean, think about that exercise. What, what's that irreplaceable object that you have? Hmm. It says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy. You see, if, if our greatest treasure is some uh, painting, maybe maybe some of you guys are great uh, paint uh, collectors, art collectors, and you got some uh, Rembrandt or uh, Da Vinci or something like that, and, and you have that in, like, obviously, that is irreplaceable. Those people are gone. You can't have, there will never be another, uh, you know, Mona Lisa or whatever. It's a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous treasure. But at the end of the day, what's it really worth? When I, when I think about this, especially when I think about where moss and rust destroy, I, I, I remember this story, and you guys may recognize the name, but the, the uh, kind of the, the greatest drug uh, kingpin, uh, Pablo Escobar, you guys may recognize the name, Pablo Escobar, uh, he was called the king of cocaine, and of course because of his uh, cocaine business, everything was done in, in cash. There wasn't, uh, at least as of yet, there wasn't a PayPal account lined up. And so uh, everything was done in cash. He estimates that he lost 10% of his money a year because mice and rats would eat it in its warehouse. He made $240 million a year. $24 million a year. Literally ate by the rats, the mice. Um, I, I just, when I think about that, I just think, my goodness, that would be, I wish I was a mouse in wherever Bob Escobar lives, but, uh, <laughs> but that was, his actually, he'd write off 10%, because it would just be literally eight destroyed. You see, everything that we, all, all this, all of our treasures here on earth, they are, uh, the, the, they're going to fade away, they're going to be gone. A couple of weeks ago, um, we had my grandma's uh, estate sale, or, the, or what was left of the of the of the land. We didn't ever do, we didn't do anything except for the the land. And I shouldn't say we. I mean, I'm not part of it. It was all of my my dad's brothers and sisters and stuff. But um, whenever whenever it sold, you know, she she and my grandpa raised nine children on a farm that they had bought in uh, you know probably the 50s or 60s, and and they had 250 acres. That was their that was what they raised their nine children on. Now I think that's considered like a like a hobby farm in, in today's world. But uh, they they sold that land, and I was trying to explain to the boys how this worked. And I said, yeah, that that land sold, and, and, the, and the way it was sold and stuff, uh, it it ended up bringing about one point two uh, million dollars. And James goes, "You mean Grandma was a millionaire?" <laughs> Technically, she just didn't get to recognize any of it until she died. Can't take it with her, right? So where's the treasure? Where's the treasure? In verse 19, it says, hey, we've got to be very, very careful that we're not storing up this, 
this treasure. I do need to, unfortunately, just take a, a little bit of a break here and say what this is not saying. This is, this is in no way, shape, or form saying that it is a sin to be rich. This is in no way, shape, or form saying that you shouldn't have a savings account or that you should prepare for retirement or that you should, that you should be fiscally responsible. That's not what this is saying at all. In fact, we get more, more information on this primarily in verse 22. You've got to bring all this together. In verse 22, it says, The eye is the lamp of the body, and the eye is healthy, and then your whole body is, is a full light. There's a, there's a phrase, and I still to this day do not understand this phrase. Someone can maybe help me out one day uh, later on or whatever, but have you ever the, the phrase, that's the apple of my eye, right? Have you ever heard that? I have no idea. I've never in my life have I went like, I really want an apple. Like, and that's just, just me because of, but the apple of my eye, I don't understand. But anyway, it's the focus, right? It's, it's the focus. It's what you're going to pay attention to. It's what, it's what you're going to put in front of you. It's whatever that is. That's that treasure, for some of us, that's money, right? For some of us, that's, it's all about the money. I love listening to, uh, in fact, I enjoy listening to uh, uh, the, the football games, uh, both the, the Missouri Tigers and the Chiefs. I love listening to the radio broadcast uh, far more than the, the television broadcast. And if you ever come to my house... Uh, and watch a game, if, if things are going well, I'll have, the, I'll have the TV muted and the radio on, and it drives Katie crazy because occasionally those get mixed up, and you'll, it'll be like, there's an interception, and then like you watch it, it happens, and, and for some reason, Katie gets annoyed by that, but um, I just like to see what's going on. I like to know ahead of time, but anyway... In one of those uh, radio broadcasts, or maybe both of them, because I think they're on the same radio station, there's a, uh, an advertisement for a particular insurance salesman. And in the advertisement, they say, the goal of life is to pass as much as you can to your, your offspring, to leave a legacy. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a life insurance thing. Go to, go to such and such, and she'll get you all set up and with all the life insurance you need so that whenever you die, your loved ones can be happy. That's pretty much what it's saying. And I, I sometimes jokingly, and I hope it's a joke, uh, work with Katie because and, and, I do have different life insurance and stuff. And I say, man, when I die, she's going to have a tear in one eye and a dollar sign in the other. <laughs> um, in any case, it's, is that the goal? Is that the goal, to make as much money as we can and make sure we pass it on? My dad has a really neat uh, attitude about that, and, 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 uh, and it pretty much tells me where I stand if I should ever get any inheritance from him. He goes, Andrew, I'm not cutting anyone else's firewood. Again, I don't understand the mentality. I don't understand what that means, but I believe it means he's not going to work real hard so I can enjoy it, right? Totally fine. Totally fine. Where's the treasure? It's, the, it's what's in front of you. It's what you're going to put, put your effort into. For some, they can say, man, I don't ever want to be wealthy. For some, it's all about the stuff that they can collect. It's about the, 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 the antique whatever, the antique firearm, or the antique uh, you know, piece of uh, cabinetry, or whatever the case is. It's, it's, it's whatever you're going to put your focus on. For some, it's all about the experience. For some, it's all about, man, I want to make sure I got enough money. I, I want, if I, as long as I got two nickels to go, I'm going to save enough money so I can go on my next vacation. I want to go on my next trip. I want to do, it's what's, it's what's in front of you. That's, that, that's what the whole concept of is that, that the lamp of the body, the eye, it's what you're focused on. And unfortunately, all of these things can become wrong if, we, if they become our focus. But none of them are wrong in and of themselves. It's not wrong to go on vacation. It's not wrong to have a neat uh, you know, you know, piece of antique anything. It's not wrong for... That, none of that's wrong. But if that becomes your focus, remember what we're talking about here with Jesus, uh, with, with the Pharisees especially, is that the Pharisees had, had gotten this really skewed idea. And, and, and the skewed idea that the Pharisees had gotten is, if you are not wealthy, if you don't have stuff, if you're not healthy, then you must not be a good person. Uh, follower of God. Their, 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 their misunderstanding is that if you are not wealthy, that means you are being disciplined in some fashion from God. If you are sick, you are being disciplined in some fashion from God. That was the prevailing thought of the time. And Jesus is saying, stop that. Quit being focused on the wrong things. 
let's start laying up our treasures in uh, for heaven. What is the what is the 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 what, what is our main focus? See, we we, we sometimes we read this kind of stuff and we go, man, we I, we shouldn't be rich, we shouldn't be wealthy. Think about Abraham. Think about Abraham. He was considered a friend of God, the wealthiest uh, farmer that I've ever heard of. Just let me read it. He, he had more net worth than countries, whole countries. Think about Job. If you remember Job in the scripture, he had all this wealth, and, 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 and God and uh, Satan came up to God and said, uh, Well, no wonder Job is, is so uh, happy. You've given him everything. Give me a chance to test him, and he will, resent, he, will, he will renounce your name. And God goes, Not Job, man. I know Job's heart. Of course, God knows Job's heart. Just like he knows each and every one of us in this room's heart. And so he let, he unbound Satan and allowed Satan to go after Job with everything he had. Stripped him all the way down to the point where Job is laying in a bed wishing he was dead because he's in so much pain and hurt. And all of his uh, wealth has been taken away. And, and he never says anything negative to God. He never, uh, he never um, uh you know, disparages uh, God. He, he may do it to his own life or anything, but he never does that. And what does God do? He gives so much. He gives him even more than he ever had when he started. He was already one of the richest men in the world, and God gave him even more. If it was a sin to be wealthy, then that, that God wouldn't have done that. Think about David. Think about Solomon. Think about all these uh, titans of, uh, of, of the faith. You know, I've heard of pastors, and, and, I, and I'll make a promise, I'm going to do this one day, but I've, I've heard of pastors who, uh, after they, they've, you know, maybe wrote some books and, and really starting to get some, some money from the, their book sales and their public speaking engagement stuff, that they'll donate their salary that they've ever made to their church. They actually go back there and they say, I've worked here this much time, and they give the interest and they donate it back. Believe me, I'm going to do that, I just got to figure out how to write a book, but, uh, and then I got to find a lot of people who buy the book. But anyway, once I get a couple of those things solved... You got it, man. Just, to, just pretty much bank on that. It's not a problem to be wealthy. And if we're going to sit around and, especially if we're going to sit here in America and say that it's a problem to be wealthy, if we're going to sit here in this country and say that that if if we're going to sit here and compare ourselves, well, I'm not wealthy because I don't have Elon Musk level money. I'm not wealthy because I don't have Bill Gates level money. I'm not wealthy because I'm not you know fill in the blank whatever rich person Stan Kroenke whatever it is. I just saw I just read the other day that Stan Kroenke has offered St. Louis, Missouri, a hundred million dollars to settle his lawsuit. He has that much cash that he can offer $100 million just to settle the lawsuit. And so you go, well, I'm not that wealthy. Those guys are wealthy. Guys, we live in America. And yeah, we're, we can talk about Veterans Day. We can talk about, but because of those sacrifices for all the time that we've had it from the, from, from the creation of our great country, the fact that we can live in a, in, in, a, in a land that you have a house over your head, that you have a vehicle that you can get here with that's fairly reliable, you realize that if you have a net worth, if you if you were to sell everything you have and it's got a net worth of like twenty thousand dollars, you're in the richest ninety five percent of the world. Of the world, don't sit here and just compare ourselves to the next rich guy. Because in this room, we're all very wealthy, unbelievably wealthy. But we better be paying attention to what's the focus, what's the quote apple of our eye, what is our eyes focused on because if it's on your next dollar bill you're gonna be we're gonna be left money if it's on the next uh, the next great purchase if it's on the next piece of land if it's on the next vacation if it's on the next uh, car if it's on the fill in the blank if it's on anything but how do I serve and pro and, 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 and uh, proclaim God to the world that I encounter it's gonna be wrong 25 times, and, and again, I don't understand this. My brain, it doesn't work on this aspect. 25 times in the New Testament, we are told about this rewards that we're going to get in heaven. It messes with me. It, it hurts my brain to think about. Because the fact of the matter is, when we start thinking about rewards for heaven, these are rewards for our faithfulness. If, it, if what God gave us, we were good and honorable and good stewards, as the scripture says, that we get these rewards and they're somehow stored for us in heaven. And every time I try and figure this out, my brain immediately switches off and I start going, we have to do these things to get to heaven. 
right? We, 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 I, I, we lose our justification by faith, by what God has done for us, and we start going, we have to do all these good things so that I can get to heaven. And, and that's not it. We are saved by the righteousness that God has done for us, by what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus himself had tremendous friends who had great wealth. Joseph of Arimathea, we know that, we know that name, right? What does Joseph of Arimathea do? He offers the tomb. That, that Jesus would, would, his body would say for, well, I guess he rented a tomb, right? He only stayed there a couple of days. That was a tomb. That was a, that was a tremendously expensive thing because you didn't have a tomb that no one had ever used unless you had tremendous wealth. And he used it. So I don't think he, I don't, I highly doubt one of the 12 apostles went, oh man, Jesus died. We got to go find someone. We got to figure out a way to fulfill this, the, 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 the prophets. We got to go find someone who has a tomb that's never been used. And they went just, they happened. No, they didn't happen. Joseph of Arimathea said, man, I want to honor Jesus in whatever way I can. I want to give him what I got. When you're willing to give whatever you got, it doesn't mean God's going to require that necessarily. But you better be willing. You better be willing we better not say, you, you can have everything, but don't touch this stuff. Because every time I've done that in my life, every time I've said, God, you can have anything, but don't mess with, and I, and I you know, fill in the blank. God's like, you want to bet? No, we've got to figure out how to give it all to him. So that's what this is talking about, this God and this possessions. Yeah, we're talking about money in this particular aspect, but it's so much more than that. It's about what, 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 what are you... What are you being faithful with? Real quick note in verse 20. It says, Where neither moth or rust, rust moth or rust destroys. There were there wasn't there's actually a word for rust. Um, that word there is it would be like decay, which you, I think everyone, if you didn't know what you know, oxidation and carbon steel and all that kind of happened, how rust happens, you would just say, well, that metal is decaying. That's actually what that means. But it simply means to decay. Man, it doesn't matter how great your stuff is, it's going to decay. A couple of years ago, and I was talking about that art deal, and I got messed up in my, my outline, so I was trying to fill this in. Uh, there's, uh, the, the painting was uh, the, Fris the Frisco Jesus, I believe is what it was. And it was a uh, great work of art, everyone thought. And they went to this art dealer who was supposed to remake it. And I remember seeing, I wish I, I, wish I would have been, had more forethought and I put it up on the screen. When they remade it, it looked like a kindergartner painted over this thing. It would, in fact, it was so bad that the Louvre took it back unfixed because of how bad it was. It was like, you, you screwed this masterful work of art so badly, we don't want anyone to fix it. Because no one would have thought it could have gotten this bad. It's going to decay. These great, these great treasures that we think about, they're going to decay. So where are you going to put your hope? Where are you going to put what you have? Are we really storing this stuff up? Is, is, is life really about what can I do next? What's my next great adventure? What's my next great purchase? What's my, my next great acquisition? For about 10 minutes, I thought I could be a, a, a stock trader. I had a friend of mine who, who showed me some, some really cool tricks, and, and uh, he showed me how to do it. And of course, I'm, I'm very risk averse. And so I put what I thought was a lot of money into a particular stock. I put $200, a lot of money, into this stock. And within like six, seven days, he, he had told me something was getting ready to happen. They're going through a lawsuit. He goes, just, they're going to win it. You, you'll see, and the stock's going to double. Six days later, stock doubled, right? I'm, I'm like, call me, you know, call me the Oracle of Omaha, right? I'm, I'm, I'm the new guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this up. So I, I started doing my own research, bought a stock, um, doing what, what he had said every day for the next six months. I bought it. So the, the trick was, you, you, the trick that he showed me is you, you, you search by the lowest 52-week price. So you're going to get it below. Hence, buy low, sell high. It's kind of a trick, right? So I do this. And I buy, I spend all my earnings, so I've got $400, all, all of the total, and I put in this new stock. Every week for the next six months, it hit a new 52-week low. 
every single week I lost more money. Now you don't you don't lose it until you realize it, until you actually sell. Finally, it, it was it wasn't all that much money, but finally I'm like, I can't handle this anymore. And I sold and I got out and I lost like two hundred dollars I lost half my money. So I went, so I was back to where I started. So I'm like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done I'm done with this game. My brain can't handle this anymore. Apparently I left the alerts on my phone. I sold it at like Two fifty. I bought it at like five dollars a share. I sold it like two fifty a share. The other day, my phone dinged. It was at fifteen dollars a share. I'm like, that's why I'm not very smart, right? Like, I don't have that ability. I can't do that. My brain doesn't work that way. You know what? I'm fine with that. I'm going to try and spend my effort as much as my effort can. can. I'm going to try and spend that glorifying God. I want to try and do everything I can to say, you know what, God, if you're going to trust me with more, that's great. If you're going to trust me with less because I, you know, for whatever reason, then I'm going to have to figure out how to proclaim and glorify you with that. See, in verse 24, and we'll finish with this, it says, no one can serve two masters. And, and the two masters that we're, we're focused on right here is you cannot serve both God and money. And that's true of anything, whatever the master is. Whatever your master is, and again, I've shared with you time and time again uh, some of the some of the issues that have gone on uh, with my family. And this is really the problem with 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 living in the same town, growing up in the same town. Because when I talk about my family, you guys know most of them, and I got to be kind of careful of that. And like so far, no one's come up to me on Thanksgiving and said, "Hey, Andrew, I heard you were talking bad about me the other day." So either I, whatever I say, you don't listen to, which is probably true, or you're really good at not telling them what's going on. Um, but uh, but you can't serve two things. You, you can't. And unfortunately, my family, I have watched so many of my brothers or my uh, my uncles that have that that ultimately served alcohol. They couldn't not. When my grandpa finally died, and he had uh, he had died with uh, he, had some, he had colon cancer, he just chose not to treat it or anything. He just said, "I've, I've lived long enough." He was in his mid 70s and uh, when he died the last uh, several uh, uh, months really where he was bed uh, 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 bed stricken he had to stay in the bed there people would come and visit him this is say the last uh, month or two or three or whatever and uh, you'd go and visit and he'd have a blood transfusion about once every 21 days and then he would be pretty lucid for about 14 of those days and then it would get get worse and um, so you had this window where you could go and talk to him it was really neat um, and then he finally died. And when we were cleaning up his bedroom, uh, you know, they got the hospital bed out of there and everything like that. And I can't remember what it was. I think it was Jack Daniels, but it could have been Jim Beam. Some, some sort of hard liquor. It was an empty bottle under his hospital bed. Don't know how it got there. All the way until the end. We all thought the stories I had always heard is the children got together and they told him, hey, you got to stop this. And I was told he'd stop. I'm literally to his death. You can't serve two masters. See, with my children, one of the things that we have to worry about, and Katie and I pray, and we'll talk about this actually next week, because next week's uh, topic as it comes in the, in, the, in the scripture is the cure for anxiety. It's actually what the title is. And man, I, I certainly wish I could just read that and just be like, I'm fixed. But J, uh, Kate and I routinely talk to each other. We go, man, how do we, how do we continue to raise children in this culture where it seems like everything, everything that I hold true in the scripture is challenged? Guys, ultimately, until I can, until I can, and I can't do anything. It's got to be on their heart. But until they decide, you know what? My life, i got to serve God and no one else. We're always going to have that struggle. You can't serve two masters. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve your money. You're going to serve God or you're going to serve your wife or your husband, your spouse. You're going to serve God or you're going to serve your family. Those things are all good, right? We, we want to be honorable to our families. We want to be honorable to our wife and our spouse. But guess what? We only serve God and we, 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 we take care of and we love and we cherish and we show compassion. We all those things for our family under the umbrella, under the context of serving God. And so many times, and I think this is one of the biggest crutches in our world today, is that we've got that totally out of order. 
We go, no, 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 family first, family everything. Family, and man, I love family. Family's important. But look at your life. Does family take a back seat to God? Or sorry, does God take a back seat to your family? Who are the masters you're serving today? Our closing song.